Hello, how's everyone doing today? Good, <laughs> yeah, I see a lot of smiles, so that's great. So my name is Jocelyn Broman. I am a We The People alumni. I competed at nationals in 2006. I currently work on Capitol Hill for Representative Don Young of Alaska. Um, and I've also, I'm an attorney by trade as well. So you get all of that to deal with. So I'll let my fellow judges introduce themselves. All right. My name is Evan Gessner. I'm a civil rights attorney in Lexington, South Carolina. I've been working with the state We the People competition now for 12 or so years, and this is my first year judging the national competition. So I'm excited to be here and look forward to your presentation. And I am Francine Engel. I am a political scientist and I focus on American constitutional development. And um, I work with the Maryland Council for um, Civics and History Education. And you all are? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rachel Simmons, and the woman who is most inspirational to me is Jeanette Rankin for defying gender norms and becoming the first woman ever elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Hello, my name is Nick Maziotti, and the woman who's most inspirational to me is Katherine Johnson for her contributions to the space race despite being a Black woman at NASA. Hello, my name is Sam Bailey, and the woman who is most inspirational to me is Greta Thunberg for using her young voice to advocate for climate change. Hello, my name is Amelia Blakely, and the woman who is most inspirational to me is Susan B. Anthony for her unyielding dedication to expanding the right to vote. And on behalf of Unit 3, our advisor Gretchen Wolfing, Tahoma High School, and the state of Washington, I thank you for judging us today. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we're going to read the question, and then you get a chance to answer. So we're going to do question one today. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, I do not think the United States would come to an end if we lost our power to declare an act of Congress void. I do think the State of the Union would be imperiled if we could not make that declaration as to the laws of the several states, end quote. What impact has judicial review had on federalism? Is judicial review a counter-majoritarian practice? Please support your position. What limits, if any, would you place on the practice of judicial review? Begin when ready. It is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. John Marshall. Since its establishment in Marbury v. Madison, judicial review has played a pivotal role in federalism by creating a more centralized government. Judicial review must be used to uphold the supremacy clause of Article 6, Clause 3, which states that the Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land and every state shall be bound thereby. This clause has enabled the Supreme Court to assert the enumerated powers of Congress over state laws, as was seen in Gibbons v. Ogden, where New York law was overturned because it interfered with Congress's ability to regulate interstate commerce. Moreover, in Martin v. Hunter's Lessee, it was decided that the Supreme Court has full authority to overrule state court rulings, further binding the people of the states to decisions made by judicial review. However, the 10th Amendment ensures that judicial review does not disregard the power of the states, as seen in National League of Cities v. Ussery, where the Supreme Court ruled that Congress cannot regulate the labor market of state employees. Justice Reinquist explained in the majority opinion that this regulation is a power not delegated to the United States by the Constitution and therefore is reserved to the states. The Supreme Court eventually overturned this decision in Garcia v. San Antonio Metropolitan Transit Authority, thus reasserting federal authority over the states. Although federalism allows states to function independently from the national government, judicial review stabilizes the nation by providing a constitutional check on state authority. Judicial review is a counter-majoritarian practice that is necessary because it protects from majority tyranny within the elected branches. Through the regulation of legislative and executive power, judicial review ensures that elected officials are not abusing minority groups and properly upholding the Constitution. Judge John E. Jones III of Pennsylvania interpreted the role of the judiciary described in Article III as inherently counter-majoritarian because it provides a check against the unconstitutional abuse and extension of power by the other branches of government. For example, a majority of states considered abortion to be illegal until Roe v. Wade, where the Supreme Court ruled against public opinion and found that abortion was protected under the fundamental right to privacy. Similarly, Jim Crow laws were popularized by the South following the creation of the separate but equal doctrine in Plessy v. Ferguson. These laws were found to be a violation of the Equal Protection Clause and Brown v. Board of Education, which set a legal precedent for dismantling popular segregationist policies. By acting as counter-majoritarian, the judiciary is tasked with defending minority rights from laws that do not pass judicial scrutiny. 
No further limit should be placed on judicial review because regulations such as the requirement of a supermajority and elections of justices fail to represent the roots of the court system. Prior to the Judiciary Act of 1789, the Supreme Court required a two-thirds majority to exercise judicial review, and this policy currently remains in two states, North Dakota and Nebraska. Implementing a supermajority would undermine the court's ability to protect the rights of vulnerable groups and individuals, as many crucial decisions have been made by a 5-4 verdict. For instance, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the fundamental right to marry for same-sex couples in Obergefell v. Hodges with a 5-4 verdict. Another proposition is the use of an election process to ensure that judicial review is reflective of the people, thus limiting the power that the executive and legislative branches hold over the judiciary. Not only would this violate the appointment process laid out in Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2, but the American Constitution Society found in 2013 that campaign finance contributions bear a greater relationship with partisan loyalty. For example, the study calculated that the likelihood that Republican judges will vote along party lines increases by an average of 3% for every $10,000 contribution made to the campaign. Though the framers did not incorporate judicial review into the Constitution, it has become one of the most important instruments for checking governmental power and policymaking. Wonderful. What has the Supreme, you guys mentioned that you thought that the Supreme Court is inherently kind of counter-majoritarian, but has it always acted that way? Um, no, it has, the Supreme Court has made many mistakes along its path of being um, our highest court. You could see that in the Buck v. Bell decision, which allowed for the forced sterilization of a young woman residing in a mental institution. And they argued that this was okay because she had a trial leading up to it. And this decision was actually never overturned, but um, uh, further decisions like Skinner v. Oklahoma took away its power. The Supreme Court also made a mistake when they ruled on Korematsu v. United States, which found that Executive Order 9066, which allowed for Japanese internment, was constitutional. And although this was um, condemned in Trump v. Hawaii, this case has yet to be overturned. Um, however, it has been condemned on multiple other occasions. The court has not always been counter-majoritarian because, um, especially in recent years, um, for example, Harvard Kennedy Law found that 86% um, of Americans agree with the Bostock v. Clayton County case that LGBTQ individuals should not be fired because of their identity. And recently, the Supreme Court has actually aligned itself more with public opinion um, than it normally has, as the study, a study conducted by Stanford and Harvard found that the Supreme Court's, uh, after the Supreme Court's first term in 2020, um, the Supreme Court aligned itself with eight of the 10 major decisions uh, with public opinion. So doesn't this destroy your argument that they are counter-majoritarian? I would argue that no, it does not destroy our, our argument because though the people on the Supreme Court will switch and change and though it might not always remain counter-majoritarian in its creation, it should be counter-majoritarian. Um, but a lot of people would argue that the, the election of the, or the election or the appointment of new justices would kind of sometimes switch that balance, but it, in its creation, it should remain counter-majoritarian. Sorry, I was on mute. <clears throat> um, all right, now would any of you propose any sort of change in the judicial nomination and confirmation process? I would propose um, a change to the appointment system and follow a system like um, we see in Denmark with an independent judiciary committee that is appointed um, that's completely separate from their politics and also their chief justices are appointed within the court rather than um, I would like to respectfully disagree with my colleague. I don't think that we should change the appointment process. I think that the appointment clause laid out in Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2, which allows that the president shall nominate and appoint um, the judges of the Supreme Court, and then the legislative branch shall check that, is um, a vital checks and balances that we need in our system. To agree with my colleague, Amelia, I would argue that the appointment process is the best process laid out to appoint the Supreme Court justices. A lot of people would argue that the appointment allows the Supreme Court to align itself with the views of whoever holds the power in the executive branch, but I would argue that's not always true. You could see that with the election of Justice Earl Warren. Eisenhower appointed him um, in an attempt to sort of 
uh, mirror his conservative views, but Earl Warren just um, championed one of the most liberal courts that we've ever seen. So that's not always the same case. Many criticize the appointment process for being too political. However, the lifetime tenure um, limits the uh, influence of partisan politics on the judicial branch. And we saw this exemplified in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, where the Supreme Court did not overturn the protection of abortion in Roe v. Wade, despite consisting of eight Republicans and one Democrat. Okay, so you've um, seen to, you talked about how um, electing judges judges would not be a, a good thing. And you, you talked about um, the importance of life, lifelong tenure. But what if we had some kind of term limits where they were not actually elected or reelected judges, but they would just serve a term limit, say maybe 20 years? Is that something that you think you could get behind? Or is that supported or not supported by our Constitution? So term limits would make the appointment process even more politicized since presidents can gear their campaigns around uh, appointing someone to the Supreme Court, knowing uh, when a Supreme Court seat is going to expire. And as said by the Judiciary Committee in the 75th Congress, term limits would undermine the court's independence and expand political control. Additionally, Article 2, Section 1 states that justices shall hold office during good behavior. So to put term limits on the court would actually be a violation of the Constitution, which would mean that it would require a constitutional amendment. Uh, to disagree with my colleagues, I would argue that a, a term limit or actually um, a mandatory retirement age would be the best. Looking to our own state of Washington, uh, our Supreme Court has a mandatory retirement age of 75. And I would argue that implementing that would be a an excellent point on a federal scale to avoid things like health issues. Thank you. Let's go back to something else. I mean, part, okay, well, actually just continuing on. Part of the issue with the partisanship with the judicial confirmation process is that constitutional interpretation and how a judge interprets it is viewed as critically important. So what do you think about how constitutional interpretation and different theories on that actually influence, does that actually influence judicial review? I would argue that yes, it does influence judicial review. As many know, Justice Scalia was a textualist, which means that he believes that the Constitution should be interpreted directly as the words are written by the original author. However, I think that the life tenure of judges does allow um, for a consistent constitutional interpretation when um, multiple cases are being brought to the court. I would like to agree with my colleague in that interpretation does influence judicial review. I support a rationalist approach to the Constitution, and rationalists actually believe that the 14th Amendment forbade racial segregation at the time of its ratification, despite the Plessy v. Ferguson ruling with the Supreme Court actually validated with modernism. So with that idea, should we just designate different seats on the court? Like, that's the textualist chair, that's the originalist chair, that's the progressive living constitution chair. Why don't we just do that? Wouldn't that take away some of this partisanship and all of the views would be represented? I would argue that no, that that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be designated because I would say that though the interpretation of the constitution is very important in each individual's view on judicial review and how they enact judicial review, I think that putting them in specific spots would be very dangerous. You could see that with um, the appointment of Amy, Amy Coney Barrett, where a lot of people are assuming her views because of who she um, worked with or was trained under, but we have yet to see whether or not she is actually a textualist as many people assume. And I would argue that um, by designating them in specific chairs, you would be limiting their scope of power or limiting their uh, maybe ability to change. Although that is a, uh, an interesting idea, um, I don't think it would limit political influence on the court system because um, it often lies between the legislative and the executive branches. According to the Cato Institute, the Senate only confirmed 60% of the judicial nominees um, under a divided government versus 90% confirmation rate under a unified government. Yes. Uh, well, actually, that's time. Okay. So. I was Fantastic like, I can't job there, but okay. <laughs> let's yeah, let's recognize the students for their hard work and congratulations on your participation. Yeah, um, that yeah. was that was fantastic and very well done. Um, we heard a couple cases I think that we hadn't heard yet. The Givens v. Ogden, I think that was the first time we'd heard that, and Hunter's Lessee, 
that was good um and the discussion of like 10th amendment i actually had, probably should have just tried to sneak the question in see if someone could have got it uh I, like i feel like your statement or i think what i heard is that you're comparing a little bit of state level judicial review and federal level judicial review. So I would have loved to have the opportunity to ask like, what's the differences and does it actually matter? Um, but otherwise you guys did a great job with answering my question and then pushing back on the counter majoritarian question. And I think I, I would have liked a little bit more of a historical view of that and seeing like maybe talking about the Lochner era and how that changes and does that actually mean that they change, were counter majoritarian at some point and then switched or does it matter what kind of cases we're talking about like if we're talking about bill of rights versus state regulations um I, that could have been done a little bit more but overall it was an excellent presentation um those are more just I'm being nitpicky because you guys did such a good job um but no, it was a very interesting discussion and you guys did a great supporting examples to back up your, your reasoning and your application. So great job. All right, everyone, great job. Um, you know, yeah, when sometimes when teams do as good as this, you do have to get a bit nitpicky and, and try and find something to critique. Um, overall, I mean, really, really very great presentation, especially mentioning Earl Warren, that, that's something I had brought up earlier today when you talk about you know, the, the, conf or the appointment and the confirmation process and the politics behind that, that once these justices or the chief justice is appointed and confirmed, they're very much their own people. And what exists, you know, when Eisenhower appointed Earl Warren, that the country was in a specific status quo. And then when you go into the 60s, things were different. And I don't think anyone would have envisioned that Earl Warren would have led the charge that he did. Um, like someone brought up the uh, how they handled things. Was it Denmark? I thought that was very interesting. I, I'd never heard that before. That that was that was yeah. That's not uh, just an, a, a neat thing to think about. But then uh, someone else on the team had said, and it's always good to to disagree with one another. But pointed out that you know you'd have to amend the constitution to do that. And then I don't, that's probably extremely unlikely. I think that's true. Um, really the only critique I would have of your presentation at all. And again, this is getting nitpicky, just looking for something. And your uh, main presentation, I felt you all switched off a little too rapidly. That's a, each one, would you get an idea out and it went to somebody else? It kind of changed and left me a little bit dizzy. But other than that, it was a great presentation. I can't find any other fault. All right, and I thought I thought you did an amazing uh, job, both in your presentation, but even more impressive is the follow-up questions because that you know you can prepare for that statement, you know what you're going to say, but you have no idea what's going to come at you with the follow-up questions. And I thought you did a fabulous job with the follow-up questions. Um, you know you answered the specific questions that we asked you, which doesn't always happen. Um, and I thought you really tried to sort of flesh out, um, you know, the answers and it showed you have, sh you showed through your response that you had thought about the stuff. Um, and so you had pretty well developed uh, responses to these questions that you, you know, we asked you on the fly, uh, which is very impressive. Um, and I also like that you had different points of view and you weren't afraid to um, you know, disagree with each other. I, I really, I just thought you did a, a really great job um, with those follow-ups. And even in the follow-ups, you had many examples that you gave to back you up with specific court cases, uh, citing things in the constitution. You had um, statistics from different studies. So. And again, you didn't know what was going to be coming at you. So I thought that was really good. Okay. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Congratulations.